for the word. All right, cool. So, uh, I'm, what am I calling this? Militant love. There we go. And uh, this is sort of a, um, it's a classic message for me. If you've been around for a while, uh, you'll know this one. And I'm, I'm going to kind of share a shorter version of it. But what I really want to go after here today is a time of prayer, too, where everybody gets uh, soaked in God's love. How's that? So that's what we're going after. But I kind of want to set the table again with this uh, very classic message for me. And if you, even when you come in the door, first time here, give you a little book out there that says he first loved us, right? And that's, uh, it's the same message. Uh, but I, I, haven't, I haven't actually shared it on a weekend for a very long time. And I just want to do that and then have some prayer time. But, uh, you know, as I, I think we just, oh, it's back. That was weird. Okay. We'll see. Anyway, so I've been uh, kind of seeking God for the, you know, the couple of months on this summer, really pressing in for more of the, uh, just the work of his Holy Spirit, right? more healing type of ministry. And, and God's been bringing me to different scripture verses where I just spend 20 or 30 minutes kind of praying into it and really, you know, absorbing it and listening to what he has to say to me. And then he'll take me somewhere else. And he's been, you know, saying different things to me that I've just been writing down. And, uh, and so I've, you know, been sharing a little bit of those things with you. I'm on a journey, but it's going in a great direction, and uh, we have a whole lot more healing ministry coming, because it's just who Jesus is, amen? And uh, anyway, he's, uh, a couple of weeks ago, he just impressed something on me, said this to me, and I wrote it down. He said, my love is militant, not comfortable. And I knew what he meant. That was, that was for me, but maybe it'll speak to you too. That uh, we, t we tend to kind of measure God's love in terms of, well, if he's making me comfortable and fixing everything that's, you know, inconvenient or causing me any problem, any distress in my life, if he makes me comfortable, then he loves me and everything's good, right? And uh, that's... Uh, that's a very limited understanding of God's love. Let's put it that way, right? So uh, when God loves, God's love pours into us initially when we come to him, uh, we come to him very broken usually. At least a lot of us do, right? And, uh, and people, everybody comes to Christ broken in some way, a little bit or a lot, but we come broken in some way. Except maybe the very few people that, you know, they grow up in just a, a Christian home where they're just, you know, they grow up in faith, they grow up in love, and they can't remember when they even accepted Jesus. Uh, but for the most part, we come kind of broken to the Lord and, and he starts to pour his love into us. And one of the first things that happens is that love starts to heal us. Is that true? Absolutely. And it's, and it's supposed to heal us. He loves us and he wants to heal our hearts, what's broken in us, what's damaged, what's, you know, all, all of that. And so he, he does heal us. But then as he continues to pour into us and as we continue to pursue him, uh, what happens then is something changes and then our focus goes on to other people, right? And now it's like, okay, God's healing me and filling me with his love, but how about this, these people that are around me, right? Loved ones, neighbors, friends, whoever it may be. Some of them don't know the Lord at all. Some of them are broken themselves. Some of them know the Lord, but they're off track and they're, you know, hurting. And, and so our heart turns to these other people and that love is supposed to overflow us, right? And start drawing our attention to other people. And that's, that's what's supposed to happen, right? It's absolutely what's supposed to happen. And, it, and the love becomes militant. And uh, I want to explain militant just one more time because when we think about militant, ordinarily we think in terms of identify the enemy and go hurt him, right? Go crush the enemy. And that's not what we're talking about here, even though Jesus did crush the devil on the cross, right? And, uh, but, but what we're really talking about here is Jesus famously said, I did not come to destroy men's lives. I came to seek and save what was lost, right? Even when they were traveling through Samaria, shared this a couple weeks back, and, you know, the Samaritans didn't want to let Jesus and his group through because they were the Jews and, you know, all that dumb stuff. And, uh, and John, the apostle John said, should we call down fire from heaven, Lord? And toast him, right? And Jesus said, no, <laughs> right? We're, I didn't come to destroy men's lives. I came to save. I came to seek and to save what was lost. So his love is militant in that way. And I know the Lord's been urging me to go after more militant love. What does that even mean? When you're praying for somebody that you love that doesn't know Jesus, pray unceasingly, right? Pray militantly. Pray without quitting until until they're all saved and in God's will. Amen. That's militant love or show love militantly to people. I mean, proactively, right? Aggressively show love aggressively, you know, reach out to bring healing to people's lives around you if you can, right? That's what that means. And, and in my case also, I know that, uh, like this healing ministry is supposed to be increased, right? We're supposed to be getting a whole lot more people saved in our community. We've made a difference in this community. We have, we have, uh, but I want to, I want I want that to be a whole lot bigger. How about you? 
Is that okay? Yeah, this is not, church isn't just a club for us, you know, to feel good. Uh, I want to make a, a lot bigger difference in the community than we have in the past. And that's militant love. It's not just, oh, I'm comfortable, we have a nice church here. I want to... I want to make an impact bigger than ever before. And so that means praying more, fasting more. It means, it means uh, seeking God for more healing ministry, for people to get set free and word to spread. That's militant love. That's what I'm talking about. It's not about getting comfortable. Uh, but Jesus does heal our hearts when we receive him, doesn't he? If you let him, if you, if you spend time with him, he absolutely will. Okay, so terms defined there. Uh, let's go to 1 John 4, 8 again, because I've read it the last two weeks, and I want to open with it again. It says, uh, he who does not love does not know God yet, implied, because God is love. His essential nature is love. Who he is is love. And, and that's absolutely, uh, yeah, how we understand him. Um, and in the... Uh, in the Old Covenant, there is a command. How many are familiar with it? There's an old a command in the Old Covenant that said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, all your might. Okay, everybody's heard that if you've, if you've been in church uh, ever. You've probably heard that preached, <laughs> right, at some point. And uh, that's, that's true, but it's part of the Old Covenant. And I want to talk about that a little bit. Uh, Remember last week, how many were here last week? I talked about forgiveness. Okay, most of you that were here last week had talked about forgiveness, that uh, God wants us to forgive, right? And, and I had this pivotal moment that I shared with you last week, and I just want to review it very quickly. Had this pivotal moment years ago when I realized the difference between the old covenant and the new covenant, right? And, and the same thing happens with the love of God, so that's why I'm sharing this. So in the old covenant, uh, we know that Jesus was teaching under the old covenant, right? And he said something like, you know, if you don't forgive your brother from your heart, neither will your heavenly father forgive you, right? And, uh, but then Ephesians 4.32, a little bit later in the Bible, says... Uh, forgive one another because God in Christ has forgiven you, right? And uh, those are two different things. One is forgive to be forgiven. The other one is forgive because you've been forgiven. And I didn't know the difference. And I was preaching one time years ago right, to a group of people and said, Jesus said, if you don't forgive, you won't be forgiven. You know? And uh, the Holy Spirit spoke inside of me and said, you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> And that was just a shocking thing. You don't want to hear that from God, especially when you're preaching to people, right? Like you're the expert. And uh, I'm actually telling people something that isn't even right. Wow. So I had an appointment with God and got that straightened out. And the Holy Spirit, of course, brought me to Ephesians 4.32, which says, uh, forgive people, forgive one another because you've been forgiven in Christ. And, and I understood in that moment, long story short, that it was the cross that changed everything. Jesus on the cross provided forgiveness for us when we've received it. Now he says, forgive because you've been forgiven. Huge difference, right? So that pivotal moment really changed my understanding of the Bible. And it also applies to the, uh, to the idea of loving God and being loved by God. So let's read actually uh, Deuteronomy 6, 5. This was... The old covenant commandment given uh, through Moses to Israel, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Wow, pretty high bar, isn't it? Right, and, and we know that, uh, well, did they do it? Did they accomplish it? The answer is no, right? They never did. Uh, Sin-infected people are really incapable of loving God with all of their heart. It's just, it just doesn't, doesn't work. Uh, the, only, the only one who did was Jesus, right? But everybody else fell short of that bar. And that was kind of the purpose in my, in my understanding is that God said, here's the bar, right? Uh, but this is given so that you can realize that you are spiritually bankrupt and you need a savior, right? You need rescue. You need forgiveness. You need mercy, right? Uh, but there was this command to love God with all your heart and all your soul. There's also commands, uh, Leviticus 19, 18. Let's read that one which says, you shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall, what is this one? Love your neighbor as yourself, right? I am the Lord. So this is also a very famous commandment, you love your neighbor as yourself. But actually, this is the place, by the way, where Jesus was referring to when he said, under the old covenant, if you don't forgive your brother, neither will your heavenly father forgive you. It's right from here. You shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of your people. It was literally against the laws of Moses to bear a grudge. 
It was literally against the laws of God to keep anger towards somebody. And that's why Jesus said, don't forgive, you're not forgiven, because that's what the law says. But we also know that the, the, the law ended on the cross when Jesus said it is finished, right? When he died for us and he paid for our sins with his blood, with his life, breathing his last breath, and he said it is finished. And the old covenant ended and we we're forgiven if we receive it. And then he rose from the dead on the third day and the new covenant begins, right? And the new covenant, he says, go into all the world and preach the laws of Moses? No. Go into all the world and preach the gospel now. Preach what Jesus did for you, right? And that's why the commandment to forgive changed from forgive to be forgiven. It changed to forgive because you've been forgiven. And also something changed in this command to love people too, because this was a command to do it under our own power, a command, you do it, prove that you are good enough, prove that you can do this, right? And uh, earn your salvation kind of. So something changed drastically there. Uh, go to uh, 1 John 4.19, please. Here's what the new covenant says. We love him because he commanded us to. No, we love him because he first loved us. Right? And some of you know this very, very well, because this is su super classic for me, a signature message. However, I really want to uh, set the table again for everybody here, and I want to spend a time of prayer where you get soaked in God's love today. It's really what I'm after. But uh, so we love him because he first loved us. From, uh, from the time of the resurrection, the new covenant begins, and there's still all the New Testament letters that were written after that time, right? In the New Covenant, is there a command in there anywhere to love God? The answer is no. And that was shocking to me. There is not a, initially, there is not a command in there to love God. And, but how many have heard a pastor preach it? Oh, come on. Okay. So, yeah. And, uh, and it's not a bad thing. I mean, it's in the Bible, right? However, 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 <laughs> if that's your message... If you're preaching, God commanded us to love him with all of our heart. The problem is you're preaching from the wrong covenant. <laughs> you're preaching from the wrong covenant, right? Is that an issue? Turns out, yeah, it is actually because we're in the new covenant. And it's kind of like covenant is almost like a word contract, but a whole lot bigger, right? Covenant is way bigger, but we can understand contracts today. So if you go to court and you're trying to, trying to enforce the terms of a contract, Right? And you tell the judge, well, this is what the contract says. And the judge looks at it and goes, but that's the wrong contract. You're reading the wrong contract. Here's your contract. And you go, oh, oh, right? <laughs> that's what we're doing when we're preaching something from the old covenant as if it's supposed to apply to us today. And God's like, come on, wrong contract, <laughs> right? wrong, contra wrong covenant. The new covenant says we love him now because he first loved us. And we forgive now because we've been forgiven. Yeah. Wow. He first loves us. That's amazing. So under the old covenant, God called Israel, my servants, right? My servant Israel, I command you to love me with all your heart. In the new covenant, he calls us what? Sons and daughters, right? We're born again. We're born again, sons and daughters. And when you, how many, how many of you, when you had a child, you looked at that newborn baby and you said, baby, I command you to love me with all of your heart. <laughs> right. Every one of them. Yeah. <laughs> no, but the, the thing is, when we have children, even in this broken world, right, we know you love that baby, right? You don't, you don't command the baby to love you. <laughs> baby knows nothing except, you know, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm hungry, I'm wet, I'm, I'm whatever. Uh, oh, I'm alone. Ah! And so, what do you, you love the baby, hug the baby, kiss the baby, change the baby, feed the baby, love the baby some more. Just repeat, right? Repeat, repeat, repeat. Love the baby, love the baby, love the baby. You're pouring love into a little heart. And at some point, that baby now starts to have recognition, looks back at you and loves you because you first <laughs> right? loved him or her. And that's what, that's what God says. You're my babies now. You're born again. The moment you got born again, you're my baby. I love you. I love you. Here's the covenant we're in now. You're born again. You're my child. I'm going to love you first. And after a while, you'll love me back. 
wow, it's better, isn't it? It's better. And I'm not making this up. This is Bible. This is absolutely what the Bible says. And we need to know this. Um, so let's, let's, let's read. Oh, let me, let me give you a little bit more background on this. Um, so the Bible says that uh, God is love, right? We read that, 1 John 4, 8 and 16. God is love. And the Bible says, in the beginning, God created us in his image, Right? And if God created us in his image and he is love, we were created for love, weren't we? We're created for love. We actually were created for relationship. God wants somebody to love. Love always wants to express itself. Love always wants an object to, to pour out love on. God created you specifically for the purpose of having a relationship with him so that he could love you and you could love him back. That's the reason you exist. You got to know that. There's no other reason. It's not evolution. It's not a big bang. You exist because God created you so that he could have somebody to love who might v willingly love him back. Right? It's why you exist. It's why you breathe every moment. Right? You don't have to justify your existence any more than that. God made me because he wants somebody to love. Now, let's build on that. Amen? All right. So... God created Adam and Eve, and the Bible says God is love. So Adam and Eve's hearts were connected to God, and God's, God is the flow. He's the source of all true love, and so God's love is flowing into Adam and Eve's hearts, right? And that's how it was designed to be. We were, we were designed, our hearts were designed to receive love and to give love. It's literally not our physical organ, but our, but our spirit man, our heart, our being inside was designed to, for this one function, receive love, give love. And everything else is details. And uh, Adam and Eve were, I think was good, and they're connected to God's heart, and God's love is flowing into their lives. But then, you know, the story maybe, and right? Satan came, this rebel angel came to tempt and, and uh, cause division, cause trouble. Adam and Eve sinned against God. And the Bible says that their hearts were disconnected from God, literally disconnected. Actually, God had told them, if you, if, if you sin, you you die and he didn't mean physically die that day he meant you experience separation disconnection from god so their hearts were separated from god and if your heart is separated from the only source of actual love in the in the world guess what happens your heart gets dry doesn't it like a i've used the term like a dry sponge or also like a car without gas just like a car is designed a car is designed to go and drive right and transport however a car without gas what does it do yeah it's, yeah, it's powerless. It's powerless. And you were designed for love. Your, your tank is for, designed for God's love. That's what you run on is God's love. And so when we were in Adam and Eve and the human race was separated from God's heart, uh, we're running on fumes as a, as a people, as a race, as a, right? We're running on fumes. There's a love deficit in the world. And uh, I could go into detail, but trying not to do that today. So Jesus came to fix that. Jesus came to, right? Jesus came to reconnect our hearts to God's heart so that this love could flow again, right? And so when Jesus pays for our sins on the cross, paid in full with his life, with his blood, and he said, it is finished and breathed his last and it was done, we were forgiven if we receive it. And then he rose from the dead. And then he gives us the promise that if you, right, if you look to him in faith and call on him in faith, that his spirit will come into you and you will be born again. In that moment, you'll be a child of God with a new spirit and the Holy Spirit's living inside of you. And what he's doing, he's reconnecting your heart to God's heart. And when your heart's reconnected to the source of love, guess what happens? Love can flow again, right? You don't run on fumes. Love is love can pour into your heart, and that's the design. So that's what Jesus did for us. Uh, in fact, uh, Romans five five gives us a little bit more detail on that. Romans five five says, "Hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out into our hearts by what? the Holy Spirit who is given to us." And so, I understand this. Of course, Holy Spirit is third person of God, right? Uh, but he's given to us, and the Holy Spirit, my understanding, he is the connection between Father God's heart and our heart. He is where the love flows through. So if you're going to pour oil into your car engine, right, do you just throw some oil in that direction and hope for the best? Or do you, 
<laughs> I know, I know some of you are like, yeah, I got it. <laughs> I did that too and found out that you know, there's a little funnel you can get. I know, right? It's all I know about cars. But if you put a little funnel there into the oil tank and you pour the oil through the funnel, it actually goes to the right place. It's really cool. And so that's all I know. Uh, however, <laughs> it's kind of the same thing. God wants to pour love into our hearts. The, the vehicle, the vessel is the Holy Spirit and the love pours into your heart through the Holy Spirit who is now living inside of you, connecting you to God. Beautiful, huh? How super cool. Um, so what this actually tells us, though, in our relationship with God and how we interact with God now is, let's compare Old Covenant, New Covenant again. In the Old Covenant, if the command was love God with all of your heart, being, soul, strength, mind, everything, uh, what people were having to do basically is, is police themselves all the time to make sure that everything they do is loving God, right? Because their nature was saying, I want to be selfish and I want to do what I want to do, but I'm policing myself. So I do this and I do that. And I, and I love God and I make sure I'm policing myself all the time. And then also love your neighbor as yourself. I don't want to, but I'm policing myself and making myself do this because the commandment of God is to do that. Sounds like a lot of fun, huh? Right. <laughs> But in the new covenant, it says you're born again, you're a child of God, your nature is changed, and your heart is reconnected to God. So instead of, yeah, instead of policing yourself, here's what you're called to do in the new covenant. Remember when Jesus said, abide in me? Yeah, he, what he's saying is, come to me on a regular basis and let me fill your tank. Come to me on a regular basis and say, Father, will you pour your love into my heart again? Will you soak my the dry sponge of a heart? Will you soak my heart with your love, God? Will you pour your love into my heart, God, and fill me up again? And he says, yeah. Yeah. Because I first love you, child, right? I'm here. I'm, I'm the source of love. Uh, how many know you can't give what you don't have? Right? If, uh, can you give somebody a million dollars if you do, don't have a million dollars? Can you give them $5 if you don't have $5? <laughs> you can't give what you don't have, right? So when God says, right, love your neighbor as yourself, you know what? I can't give what I don't have. So it turns out the new covenant way is come to God and say, God, will you fill me up with your love again so I can love? And he says, yep, yep. So as you ex have a relationship with God, first thing that happens is you learn to love God. Right? Or you experience loving God, just like a child begins to experience loving their parents, right? And then you begin to love yourself. This, this overflows into now you value yourself and you respect yourself and you take care of yourself in a healthy way, right? And then it translates into, wow, now I love people. Now it's starting to overflow and I look at people and I go, oh, wow, I care about you. <laughs> right? I, want, I want you to be saved. I want you to be set free. I want you to be healed. I want you to be blessed, Oh, wow. How can I, how can I, right? And so we start on this cycle now walking with God of God, fill me with your love to overflowing. And his love always heals us first. It does. It heals us first, but then it overflows and we say, oh, now I want you to be loved also. Now I want you to be saved. And right. This is the natural cycle now of our relationship with God in the new covenant. It's not policing yourself as much as it is coming back to him again and again and saying, oh, fill me up, God, fill my gas tank, soak the sponge so I can go out and right. Yeah. Uh, does that make sense to everybody? It's good. So one of the things the Lord impressed on me, um, yesterday actually was just the idea is sharing this message uh about militant love right let's one of the things is let's be militant about it the goal is not just to get comfortable so all my problems are solved everything's convenient for me now so god loves me so we're all good you know militant love is let's go for the overflow let's pursue god on purpose so that right so that i have overflowing love to give to people who are hurting people who are lost right um, that's awesome. The other thing God impressed on me was go for double. Like just ask him for double, uh, double, what? double capacity to love, double capacity to receive love, double capacity to give love, just double. Is it scriptural to ask for double? It is actually, it is. Yeah. Uh, I'll give you, I'll give you a story. Second Corinthians. Uh, I'm sorry. Second Kings, excuse me. Second Kings two, nine. Yeah. This is a, the old Testament story of the prophet Elijah 
who was a great prophet of God in Israel, anointed by the Holy Spirit, miracles and prophesied to Israel. But his ministry is coming to an end, his time's coming to an end, and God has chosen the new, new guy, Elisha, to kind of be, take his place, right? So Elisha's following Elijah around, learning from him, and, you know, kind of being mentored. Uh, and this is the day when Elijah is going to go to heaven, I mean, I don't mean die and go to heaven. I mean, God's going to actually take him to heaven and just, right? That's pretty cool. But uh, this is the day. So when they had crossed over, Elijah said to Elisha, ask, what may I do for you before I am taken away from you? And Elisha said, please let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. And he's not talking about Elijah's personal spirit. He's talking about the spirit of God that's upon Elijah. Elijah right? He's talking about the anointing of God, spirit of God, that measure of the spirit of God that works in Elijah's life. And Elisha said, uh, double, can I have double what you have? Okay. And, uh, you know, some of us, our own minds would immediately go, I can't ask for that. That would be selfish. That would be terrible. And did God say that? Did God say, Elisha, who do you think you are? How presumptuous of you to ask for double? No, he doesn't. God likes it. God looks at Elisha and goes, you're asking for double? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right? Because what that means is you put value on the spirit of God. You put value on the presence of God and the power of God. You put value on that. And Elisha said, I, I just want double what you walk in. That wasn't greedy. That was, that was, right? That's faith. And God likes it. Especially if we're asking for more so that we can give it away, right? We can minister to others and give it away. Then God's like, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's great. So in this story, of course, he's asking for double anointing of the Holy Spirit, but can we also ask for double love? That's what we're talking about today, right? Can we ask for double revelation to understand God's word better? Can we ask for double blessing in our life so we can be a blessing to other people? Yes, absolutely yes, right? Yeah, don't let the devil talk you out of that one. Yeah, go after double. If, you, if there's something you really hunger for in God, say, can we double it, right? <laughs> so I want to I pray today specifically to double our capacity to receive God's love and double our capacity to give and love others. That's a militant thing to do. <laughs> so how do you know if it's doubled? How do you measure? How do you measure love? Can you measure love? It turns out I think you can. I'll give you one, one verse here that... Uh, I'll share before we go into prayer in a few minutes more. It's Ephesians 1, 5, 1 and 2. In the New Testament, uh, Paul wrote this, Therefore be imitators of God as dear children. And uh, that's how children learn, right? They imitate parents, okay? So he says the same thing. You're God's babies. Uh, learn to imitate God as your father. And specifically, what does that mean? It means to walk in love. As Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. So this is saying if we're going to imitate God, uh, that means we learn to walk in love, and that Christ also gave us that model and that example, right? And that he came and he loved us when we were lost to save us and draw us back to himself, draw us back to God's heart, and that he did this by giving himself for us as an offering and a sacrifice. Hmm. So years ago, uh, I was reading this verse, and God, God uh, has kind of spoke something to my heart that stuck with me ever since. And he said, there is no true expression of love that does not involve sacrifice. And boy, that just went deep into my heart. There is no true expression of love that does not involve sacrifice. If my expression of love is just purely on my convenience when I feel like it and when I'm in the right mood and it doesn't cost me anything, that ain't love. It's love when it costs me something. It's love when I have to give up selfishness. It's love when I have to give up convenience. It's love when I have to give something valuable. It's love when, when I do something for both of us that I don't want to do myself. You know what I'm saying? Love always is self-sacrificing, always unselfish. And if it, if it isn't one of those things, it isn't really love. And God made the ultimate expression of love by sacrificing himself for us on the cross. And he says, here's your example. Let's all grow into it. <laughs> wow. And uh, this, is, this is a real challenge because the sin infection, I think I shared last week, the sin infection that happened in the human race from the beginning, uh, the essence of sin infection is selfishness. It's selfishness. When we're infected by sin, we're selfish. I want what I want. Don't get in my way. 
right? Don't disagree with me. Don't cross me. Don't hinder me. I want what I want, right? And uh, love, it turns out, is the opposite of self selfishness. And selfishness is the opposite of love. And every true expression of love involves unselfishly giving sacrificially in some way. And, and we all, we know that um, in relationships, don't you sacrifice for a valuable relationship? Don't you do things maybe together you wouldn't say, oh, I wouldn't want to do that personally, but we'll do it together for the sake of a relationship. When you get married, uh, is there a sacrifi sacrifice involved? Um, dating, for starters, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, when you have children, is there sacrifice involved? Yes, thousands and thousands of sacrifices begin immediately, right? And they don't stop for a long time. <laughs> love, amen. <laughs> That's love. That's love. That's love. That's love, right? <laughs> so can you measure love? Turns out you can. By sacrificial, unselfish things. And so if we ask God to double our capacity for love and double our expression of love, you think, is that okay? <laughs> yeah. And it's scripturally, yeah, sound, absolutely. Oh, that's what I want to do today. That's what I want to do. Let's, uh, can I have either instrumental or guitar? Can we have some a little, or a keyboard, either way? What you got in mind, Todd? Keyboard, yes, good, good. Okay, so what I'd like to do, you can just, you know, stay where you are right now. Um, sometimes I ask you to stand for this, but I think right now let's just, uh, you know, just, just right where you're at. Just for a few more moments, I want to just have a love encounter with God. So based on this message, what this looks like again is if we're going to ask for double, I'm not asking you to police yourself and say, to love my neighbor. I'm going to try twice as hard to love God. That's not what I'm asking you to do at all. I'm asking you to open your heart, come to God right now and say, Father, pour your love into me. I can't give what I don't have. So Father, pour your love into me. In Jesus name. Just if you would close your eyes and maybe just come face to face with Jesus. Heart to heart with Jesus. Again right now and Hmm. Come to receive because he's here to give. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God, that we love you because you first love us. We're your babies. We're your sons and your daughters, and you love us. And you are the source of all true love. You're not asking us to perform. You're asking us to receive. You're asking us to receive until we overflow. So God, we come. Hmm. Maybe if it's not super out of your box also, just close your eyes and lift your hands and say, Father, I open my heart to you. I open my heart. Fill me. Father God, fill me with your love. Fill me with your love. Yeah, just keep, the, the, keep your prayers going. You can just whisper it. But Father, pour your love into me through the Holy Spirit who's given to me. Pour your love into me, God, just like gas into a car. Just like water soaking a sponge. Soak my heart, God, with your love. Saturate me, God with your powerful, powerful love. Thank you, God, that your love heals us first. It fills us and it heals us. But then it overflows us and it draws our attention to the people around us. Hallelujah. Draws our attention to the people around us. Still just soak. Just, just keep asking. God, we ask you for double. We ask you for double. 
double the love we've ever experienced before, God. Double the capacity to receive your love, God. Enlarge our hearts, God, in a good way. Enlarge our hearts to receive more and to love more. Hallelujah. Father, continue to pour your love into people's hearts as we just soak in your presence, God. So it, it kind of depends where you're at. If you're, if you're still having your heart healed, God's probably going to be focusing on that for you, healing your heart right now, filling you. If your heart is pretty healed, then God's probably with you drawing your attention to what this means now for you to be a blessing to other people. Most of us are somewhere in, in the middle there. We're still getting healed, but God's also drawing our attention to the people around us. Most of us are in the middle there somewhere. And maybe ask God a question right now as we're just waiting in his presence. Uh, just whisper a question to him. God, what is it in my life that you want to heal? Maybe something in your, in your heart a wound from the past emotionally or something like that. It may be a wound. It may be a hurt, a bitterness. It may be, I don't know. I don't know. A rejection. Maybe God's healing something in your body. His healing flows through his love. So maybe right now he's healing something in your body, literally a disease or a, a wound or an injury. Jesus, come with healing. Come with healing. Again, touching your people right now in their hearts, in their bodies, in their minds. If he's impressed something on you that he wants to heal, just, just invite that. Say, yes, Jesus, heal. Heal me in my, in my heart, in my mind, in my body, whatever he's drawing your attention to. Ask him to heal that. Just receive. His healing flows through his love. And his love is poured into your heart by the Holy Spirit who's given to you. Thank you, Lord. Still more, God. Soak every heart. Saturate every heart, God. Double, double. God, anything in us that hinders love, God, we ask you to take it out. Any selfishness in us that hinders love, God, just we surrender it. Take it out. Any bitterness or unforgiveness for some, something in the past, any unforgiveness, we surrender it, God. We forgive. We forgive and we ask you to take it out, God. Any pride, any ego, any selfishness, God, we surrender it. If it hinders love, God, take it out. Just ask God also, is there something in you, in you that, he, that he just wants to take it out because it hinders love? Ask him, ask him. Just whisper that, that question to him and listen. Anything in me, God, that hinders love? You want to take it out, God, what is it? God, yeah, anything that you're showing people, we just say, take it, God, take it, we surrender it.
Thank you, Father, that you are transforming your people. You are transforming your people in the way that you intended by your spirit within us, God, transforming us by your love, by your presence, by your nature, coming to live in us, transform us from the inside, God. Thank you, Jesus. That's what you came to do. Thank you, Jesus. You came to reconnect us to the heart of God. Hallelujah. If you're next to somebody, just would you do one more thing next to somebody you're comfortable with? Just put your hand maybe on their shoulder, something like that. And just for another moment, just say, Jesus, come with healing. Jesus, come with healing. Jesus, Jesus, come with healing. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus, just touch people right now through the laying on of hands, through the prayers of faith. Touch people right now, Jesus, with your love, with your power. <sighs> oh, healing people's bodies, hearts, and minds. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. 